Good morning, everyone. Everyone's having great conversations this morning, I'm sure. I'm going to read a Psalm, Psalm 100. Shout to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's stand together as we sing forever.
name above others. Jesus, the name above every other. Father, thank you that you are here with us. You go with us wherever we go, Lord. We just want to lift up your name this morning and give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to take a moment to say hi to someone next to you and welcome them here.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow, so great to hear you all worshiping the Lord. Brett and team, thank you so much. Thank you. So when I met Brett, uh, the drummer was in the nursery. <laughs> and uh, Brett was, what, 10, 11 years old, something like that, 11 years old. Um, so I know he's grown up, uh, but he's also been growing up in the Lord as well, too. And I sure hope I've grown up in the last 20 years or so, too. Such a joy to have Brett as the oldest person up here uh, leading us this morning. I don't even bring the average age up by being up here. Yeah, so beautiful. What do we got? Let's uh, thank you, John Mark. Keep me moving here. Um, we're so glad that you're here. If you're here with us online, please um, punch that phone number in and let us know. Connect with us. You can uh, press any, put any one of those things in there and we'll get back to you. Or ask for prayer. Uh, some of you have been asking for prayer recently through that number. and We really appreciate that. And we do pray for you. Um, thank you so much for connecting with us that way. We've got a few other things going on as well. Um, in two Sundays from now, we have a town hall meeting. Uh, right before that, we're going to be having an international potluck, however, and we'll hear more about that. Maybe not this morning, but uh, we'll hear more about that next, next Sunday. All right, uh, that's really good. And then we're going to have a, a discussion on the topic of baptism, baptism and membership uh, in our local church here. So if you want to be a part of that, um, come prayed up and uh, be a part of that conversation with us. If you haven't prayed up, don't come. Um, pr pray that God uh, keeps your mouth closed when you need to and that, that you ask a positive Holy Spirit-filled questions as we have that discussion. All right. Next Sunday, I won't be here. Um, okay, keep going. Remind me about that later. Next Sunday, I won't be here. Actually, Graham and I, Graham is one of the people who leads these worship and prayer nights. We are going to be in uh, the Toronto area, St. Catharines, and we're going to be attending a church called Pony Church and Pony Express Church. Uh, there's a laundromat in uh, the St. Catharines area that's called Pony Laundromat, and they started a church in the back of that laundromat, and it's outgrown that space, and now they're renting a school and um, just filled with young people and uh, lots of people worshiping and praising God. They go out onto the streets and up at the university campuses every week and ask people how they can pray with them and share the gospel. And the church is just uh, bursting at the seams. In fact, they had to plant the Pony Express Church out of the Pony Church uh, so that they could continue to grow. And Graham and I are going to be learning uh, while we're there. We're taking a training on how to make disciples and how to plant churches. So we got to do something here. We either got to go to two services or plant a church. So be praying for our leaders as a church uh, that we'll have God's direction and, and for us as a church body to know what the next steps are as well. So the next prayer and worship night is next Sunday. Yes, next Sunday. All right, what else do we have going on? Ladies, uh, time for breakfast. Kelly and Shannon. Right? I heard of finally. We've had many requests over the years. We often do evening events, but Saturday mornings like often a day off for some of us ladies. The men, get them. <laughs> the men apparently like to have breakfast on Saturday mornings. And so we are going to have a ladies breakfast. And I was going to say we're not going to have bacon, but I've already had complaints <laughs> as <laughs> So I've already had a volunteer to make bacon. <laughs> so we will have protein, although I was going to bring yogurt, apparently. But apparently yogurt's not as appetizing as bacon, but I will let Shannon announce the date. <laughs> April 27th, not this coming Saturday, but the next Saturday at 9.30 till 11-ish. And we would love to see all of you. It's a great time for fellowship. And I know summer's coming fast. And it's a good way to connect. I know some women are walking once in a while. So that's a good place to like maybe find some walking mates for summer and just to encourage each other and get to know each other. There's so many new people here. And I can remember some of your names. I'm working on you. <laughs> so yeah, please come out, youth to yeah. everybody. Yeah, I was going to say, last week we heard that the youth are our church. So teenagers, we want you here. We like you. We like hanging out with you. You have a lot to teach us. We have a lot to teach you. So it's a great time to get to know each other. So all the way up to seniors, we'd love to have you. We do have a sign-up table out in the front. 
So come and see us, sign up, then we'll make sure we have enough bacon. But I'm also bringing berries and other, we're going to have girl breakfast too, for those of you who like girl breakfast. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Mary Charlotte, so good to have you here from Gabriola and your friend as well from Gabriola. Yeah. Well, um, we please bring greetings back to Gabriola for us. Yeah, thank you. And others that, of you that I met today for the first time, so good to have you here with us today as well. All right. If you came prepared for the Sunday School Appreciation Lunch today, we're so glad that you're here. Um, but that lunch has been postponed due to the fact that 60% of the people couldn't make it here uh, for this. So we'll have that another time. Do we know when that's going to be? No, not yet. All right, good. Okay, Jeffrey, what are we doing? Bringing the Kaleos up? You want to go first? Okay. All right. Um, many of you know that we have had five students from Camp Quanos who take the Kaleo program with us since September. And... Um, yeah, we're pretty sad that this is their last Sunday as Kaleo students. They're graduating this week. Yes, I think Saturday is the graduation ceremony. And um, yeah, so we just have so appreciated having you guys here with us this week. So will you guys come up and just stand here in any random order uh, at the front? Wait, now I gotta find. Okay, forget that. <laughs> Matthew, I'll hand these out first and then Matt. Thank you. So yes, that was very random. I shuffled the books. So glad, so glad that you guys are here and that we've had this opportunity to be with you. This book is a book that's um, uh, changing a lot of people's lives right now. It came out about six weeks ago, so it's brand new. And uh, the author sent me uh, about 10 copies. You guys have half of them. Um, so we put a little, a little uh, reading in the front there for each one of you. And we've appreciated um, serving with you, watching you grow in Christ, watching you grow as leaders. Uh, some of you came into positions that you'd never had before, uh, whether it was youth or Sunday school or whatever it might have been, or coming up here and doing kids' time or, or bringing up the congregational prayer. And it's been, yeah, it's been really beautiful watching how you have developed in that. So thank you for being a part of our church family. And we are definitely going to remember you. You guys have been a very memorable group of Kaleos. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> In a good way. <laughs> Absolutely in a good way. All right, Pastor Jeffrey, do you want to? All right. Okay. That's great. I also want to say thank you um, on behalf of our church uh, for your investment in our, in our church family, whether that's kids or youth group. Um, I don't know if you know this, our Kaleo students, um, they had, this group had the most concussions in the Kaleo program this year. And yet they survived and they thrived with the, with the programs that we did here. So thank you. Uh, despite of all the things that went up and down, uh, you guys were rock stars. Um, I want to read a verse for you from 2 Corinthians. Uh, this is what it says, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. This is what it says. Now, God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. We serve a God who is more than able and capable to fulfill his mission in and through us. And when we are available to him, 
whether that's at Kaleo, whether that's at your hometown, whether that's in a church context or a job context, he will multiply his seed. And that's his word, his gospel. And our prayer is that each one of you would be man, of, man and woman of God, wherever God puts you in, and you would really transform uh, the world for God's kingdom, and God will use you through that. Can we pray for these students? I'm going to ask all of you, if you would mind standing up and pray for them. Perfect. If you want to come to the front and put your hand over them, that's great too. Good. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the God that you are, the Creator God, the one who loves us, cares for us, who designed us, created us to, in your image to have a relationship with you and fellowship with you. And Father, we thank you for the privilege you give us to be part of your family, to part, be part of your mission, to be used by you for your kingdom. And Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. I thank you for Sophia. I thank you for Justin. I thank you for Aiden. I thank you for Matt. And I thank you for Emily. Thank you for these lives. Thank you for the work that you have done in their hearts this year at Camp Kalanos. Father, I pray that you would continue to draw them near to you, continue to transform them by your Holy Spirit, and continue to shape them to be men and women of God. And Father, I pray that their learnings, their growing this year wouldn't stop. They would continue to be students of your word and grow in a relationship with you. And so, Father, I pray for each one of them that you would empower them with your spirit, give them strength, give them wisdom and guidance as they step into the next chapter in their life, that they would listen to your voice and be obedient to you. And, Father, I pray you would provide for them, provide the right jobs, right uh, finances, right resources, whatever they need. Thank you that you are our provider. And I pray for these students that they would listen to you, trust you, and walk humbly before you. And Father, we also pray for all the Kaleo students that's graduating this Saturday. I pray that you would use them all for your kingdom, that they would be people who would change the world by your power, by your spirit. So we thank you for these students. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys. Wow. Yeah, we're really going to miss you guys. All right. Are we doing kids' time now? Is that what we're doing? Kids' time. We have a brand new um, message series, sermon series, beginning today on the book of James. And so we're going to be memorizing the first several verses of James, seven verses of James, as a church. So not just the kids. Uh, actually, it's verse 2 to 7. So those are the verses we're going to be memorizing. How many of you took one of these this morning? Oh, a lot of you. Perfect. Good. I would rather not see any of these left uh, when I go to the back later. I, w I would love for us to have to print more for next Sunday. Is that, does, can we all agree on that? Yeah. yeah. Amen. Yeah. Especially if those of you who don't have one yet, you agree that you're going to take one for your family? That would be great so we can memorize these together. So we're going to do verse 2 together this morning. Verse 1 is uh, an introduction that um, James gives to the people. Uh, just to, saying who he is and grace and peace to you from the Lord. Something like that. I'm making that up. Um, and then we dive right into the content in verse 2. So can we have verse 2, John Mark? Can we say this together? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. James 1, verse 2. Yeah, that's right. Because the trials develop what in us? Perseverance, and perseverance produces character. That's right. Good. So that some people have a jump on that. When I was in Bible college, one of our um, RAs, a resident assistant in the dorm that I lived in, encouraged us when we went home for Christmas break to um, memorize the book of James. And I can't remember what the prize was, but it was either like 100 bucks or, I don't know, dinner or something. So I spent a lot of days in the cold uh, going back and forth up and down our, our long street in Abbotsford and stopping at the curling rink uh, to warm up uh, half the time. So 
uh, really loved uh, putting that book to memory. So can we do these few verses to memory over the next few weeks? Yes, I'm not 20 anymore, but, um, you know, we can still do it. We can still do it. Just carry this around with you wherever you go. All right, what are the children learning um, today? I think I could find out. The children are learning that God's children shine. Wow, that's really good. God's children shine. And we read the verse together. All right, so teachers, helpers, children, we will see you in a little while. Enjoy your time together. Oh, and if you're new with us today, please take your child uh, downstairs and help them find the right classroom and sign them in uh, if you haven't already. Thank you. going to pray with you for a few moments uh, this morning. Let's pray together. Father God, we are so grateful today for uh, this beautiful weather that you're giving to us, and it reminds me of the beautiful weather that you gave to our uh, mission team as they went to a house a few weeks ago. Um, just reading a book from there that it's often... Oh, pretty inhospitable over there weather-wise. So thank you so much for that. And thank you that we get to enjoy this right now as well. And Lord, sometimes we um, complain or grumble a little bit about um, the spiritual temperature or even the cultural temperature of Nanaimo and Canada. And um, yeah, there are reasons to be concerned. But um, honestly, we don't have anything to grumble or complain about. Thank you so much for the freedom that we have to worship you, Lord God, the freedom to assemble like this, uh, the freedom to gather in a, a large place uh, in our homes that we don't have to worry about um, someone telling on us or the police or uh, anything like that. And Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world right now, I think especially of uh, places in India where the Hindu leaders are... Um, yeah, taking away jobs uh, from the Muslims and from the Christians and, um, yeah, just blocking them in so many ways uh, so that it's very difficult for them uh, to live and to support their families. And so, Heavenly Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters in Christ. I thank you for the incredible encouragement they are to us as we hear from them. And uh, they're praying that they will have boldness, that they're praying they're, they will have strength and God, we also want to pray for them that there will be an end to this persecution. Lord God, we pray for uh, repentance for those leaders that are uh, inciting others to atrocities and even just to persecution and uh, to shunning uh, those who are our brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, we just ask for transformed lives. We pray that the gospel of Jesus Christ will go forward in that uh, continent, Lord, in that country and in many other places around the world. And for those of us who aren't under a rock, and I usually am, and my wife helps me, we also think of what's happening in Israel uh, and in the surrounding areas. Uh, Lord Jesus, um, I don't really understand it, but in some way, uh, the nation of Israel still continues to be special and close to your heart. All people are special and close to your heart, but they have a, a unique place and that place in geography has always been a highway um, for the peoples of the world, a highway for trade and uh, a highway for languages, and it continues to be that. And Lord God, you made it that way. You put your people there so that, they, so that others who came would hear about you and know of the one true God. And uh, thank you for these verses in Isaiah that Kelly gave to me today and that were shared with her. That in a future day, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, from the south and to the north, and from the south and to the west and to the east. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. 
The Egyptians and, As- and Assyrians will worship together, worship the Lord God together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Lord Jesus, we know that you are the only hope, that you are the only one who can bring life and hope and peace. And that is why we look to you this morning. Father, we're so grateful that we get to travel through the book of James over these next number of weeks. Uh, Thank you for what you've put on Pastor Jeffrey's heart for today. I ask that you will open our hearts and that we will not just be hearers, but that we will be doers of your word, that we'll put into practice what we sense that you are saying to us. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Good morning, everyone. I trust you all are doing well. Truly a joy to be again together with you all, uh, looking at God's Word and listening to what God has to say to each one of us. Uh, Last week, uh, I was not here. I was on a quick trip uh, to India, uh, but I was watching online, and I want to say thank you for the birthday wishes that you guys said together. Um, The the going joke is I'm 32 uh, this year. I was very young. Um, 33 and a half is when people get crucified, I've been told. Um, so I have a year and a half left, apparently. So. Um, no, I was glad to be home uh, for a week. Uh, I was on the ground for about 120 hours in India and 60 hours on plane. So it was like a very quick trip. Went for a wedding. Uh, my cousin, Jonathan, who got married, um, and he invited me to lead the ceremony there. And that was a special honor uh, as his older brother. And so I was able to go and, and celebrate with him in India. Thank you for all those who shared last Sunday on our Sharing Sunday. I think that was a beautiful testimony of what God is doing in and through our church. Uh, And this, again, this morning, uh, as we see people come together to praise Him, is also a testimony. Uh, I was told we have 180 people here this morning. Amen. That's praise the Lord. We only put out 186 chairs, so that's very good. And there's people in the fellowship room. Thank you for those sitting in the fellowship room uh, as well. And many joining us online uh, this morning as well. God is at work. And He's doing a good work in and through us uh, here at Departure Bay, here in Nanaimo. And we get to be part of what God is doing here. And as we continue to worship Him, as we continue to uh, seek God and walk in His ways, we want to look at uh, this book in the New Testament, the book of James, over the next couple of weeks. How many of you have read Book of James? There's only five chapters. Um, Book of James, yeah. If I had to ask you, what's Book of James about? What would you say? Conviction, okay. Faith that works, works. yes, okay. (laughs) Thank you, Adam. (laughs) Faith that works, yeah. Book of James is going to be a very practical book, (laughs) There's going to be a lot of applications that we're going to glean uh, from the book of James. We were, if you were here earlier this year, we were going through a series about the names of God, uh, looking at different characteristics of God. And often when we look at the characteristics of God, it's a lot of theory, right? We are learning about His character, and hopefully those things will be applying in our lives where we would experience God's character in our life. And as we were preparing and thinking through, okay, what's next um, after a Names of God series, God just prompted in our hearts to look at a very practical book, and that's the book of James. And we want to look at the main theme as faith that works. Often we talk about faith, we talk about believing, we talk about doctrines, but that's just part A of our Christian life. Faith is important, beliefs are important, doctrines are important. But if it doesn't work, if it doesn't apply, if there's no practical application, then Really, it's a waste of time. And so James, we're going to see in the book of James, James is going to write a lot of things that's going to say, hey, what you believe needs to be applied. It needs to be worked out. 
There needs to be some evidence that what you believe is true. And so we're going to look at faith that works as the main theme uh, of the book of James. We're going to spend about 10 to 11 weeks in the book of James. Five chapters uh, in the book of James, and we're going to look at that uh, section by section as we go through. And I hope you will read along and study along uh, as what God, to listen to what God has to say to each one of us. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to James chapter 1. We're going to read the uh, first couple verses, uh, verses 1 to 8, and then we'll jump to verse 12 there as well. So first couple verses, just as an introduction this morning um, in the book of James. So James chapter 1, verse 1. This is what it says. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And when you ask, you must ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. All they do. Jump down to verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because... Having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I'm going to pause there uh, for now, and we're going to look at what is James wanting to say to each one of us. There are two problems, I think, with the, uh, with the Christian life, especially when two problems when we read the Scripture. One problem is uh, a mental problem. When we read the scripture, you're like, I don't really understand what it says. <laughs> Especially when you read through the Old Testament and when you get to the book of Leviticus and Numbers and you're like, what does this mean? <laughs> right? Uh, not, not making any sense. And you jump to the prophets and you're like, okay, I quit. And I jump to the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 1. Right? Sometimes we don't understand what we are reading. And we ask the question, what does this really mean? And that's a, a mind problem. But the second problem, I think, when we read the scripture, is a, it's a practical problem. It's when we understand what we read, but we don't necessarily live it. We don't do anything about it. And I suggest that many people, many Christians, have more of a practical problem than a mental problem in reading the scripture. Many scholars have talked about... Um, Bible, and some of them have said that they have difficult parts reading the difficult time reading the Bibles, especially reading the parts that they understand the most, because it it demands them to do something about it. And that's why when we look at the book of James as a whole, the main theme is going to be the action part of your faith. When you understand the Scripture, when God has revealed something to you, you got to do it. You gotta apply it. You gotta live it. That's why in James chapter 1, verse 22, this is what it says James chapter 1, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the world, word and so deceive yourself, but do what it says. Do what it says. We can deceive ourselves even this morning by listening, 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 and you say, Yes, I agree with that. Amen. Yes, praise the Lord. <laughs> and you might make notes about it, you might underline your scripture. You might even post on Instagram. <laughs> and then you'll close the book and go home and do nothing about it. That's why James says you might be deceiving yourself. In chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Anyone who listens to the word and does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. 
But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If you read those, two, those three verses, 22, 23 to 25, you'll notice in four times it says, do, 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 does, doing. You'll be blessed in the doing. Again, you're going, to read, you're going to hear this theme again and again. In chapter 2 of James, in verse 17, it says, You are blessed not on what you know, but in, in, in what you do. In chapter 2, verses 18, it says, Faith by itself, it's not, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Show me your faith without deeds. I will show you my faith with what I do. In other words, look at my life, and the real, you will see the reality of my faith. Chapter 4, towards the end of James, verse 17. It says, anyone who knows the good and he ought to do it, but doesn't do it, he sins. Sometimes we think um, we sin when we go to a situation where there's like a lot of temptation. For example, oh, if I go to a, a, a casino, then I'm going to sin and I'm going to gamble and I'm going to be in trouble. And that's true. Maybe when we put ourselves in a context where there's a lot of temptation, yeah, devil will trick us away. But do you know where the most vulnerable spot for a Christian is to sin? It's actually here in church on a Sunday morning. Because James says, he that knows what to do and doesn't do it, for him, it is sin. You might come to a Sunday church, uh, you might go to church on Sunday, you might come 52 weeks a year. Let's give you some holidays there. Maybe you're going camping and, and all the fun stuff. So let's say, take a month off. 48 Sundays a year. And maybe you come to 48 Sundays a year and you learn one little thing on a Sunday morning. Every Sunday you learn one little thing. And if you learn one little thing, guess what? You have increased your capacity to sin by 48 times. <laughs> Why? Because the thing that you learned, if you don't do it, it's sin. Says the word of God. And so James says that out of all the things that you hear, when we stand before God, God is not going to come and say, okay, Jeffrey, tell me 48 things that you learned on a Sunday morning. <laughs> no. God is going to ask, what did you do? <laughs> did you apply these? Did your faith work? There's not going to be a theological examination in heaven. <laughs> Do we live a life doing the work of the Lord as we, enable, as we engage in faith before God? That's why I suggest to you that the theme of the book is going to be faith that works. Faith that works. Do what it says. In the book of James, it's about 108 verses. 108 verses in the book of James. 54 of them gives a command. 54 of them. In every two verses, there's going to be something for you to do. Here's something to do. Here's something to do. And the biggest need for Christians, for us, is not to know more, but to start doing with what we already know. That's why this book is, again, extremely practical, and many have not liked this book because it's extremely practical. If you know uh, Martin Luther, uh, who triggered the Reformation in Europe and transformed Christianity, Martin Luther didn't like the book of James. Uh, he thought it contradicted everything Paul said in, in the book of Romans, where in the book of Romans it's justification by faith alone. And in James, he says, wait a second, you're not just justified by faith, you're actually justified by what you do. It works. And so Martin Luther said, is it faith or is it works? And it seems like contradicting each other. And so he, Martin Luther, he calls this book the epistle of straw or the letter of straw, which should be thrown out because it amounts to nothing. That was Luther's view of this book. Doctrine, theology, all important. It's the basis of our action. It's the basis of our life. 
But if we detach it from action, from practical application, then our doctrine is dead. Faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead, says James in chapter 2, verse 17. I want to look, at, look with you this morning three things as introduction in the book of James. I want to look at three things. First one, I want to look at the author. Who is writing this letter? Uh, second, I want to look at the audience. Who is he writing to? And third one, I want to look at the issues or the, really his subject line. What is this letter about and where does he start? And that's some of the verses uh, that we read this morning. So three things uh, briefly this morning. The author, the audience, and the issues uh, this morning with you. First one. The author. So, chapter 1, verse 1. It says, James is servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that begs the question. <laughs> which James are we talking about here? <laughs> if you read the New Testament, you'll notice there's actually five Jameses in the New Testament, as far as we can tell. About five Jameses in the New Testament. And out of those five... There are two, two of them that, are, that have been regarded as candidates for writing this letter. Two James that are likely to have written this letter. First one, the um, least likely of the two, is the James who was the son of Zebedee. If you know James, the son of Zebedee, he had a brother. His name was John. James and John, two brothers, they were actually two of the 12 apostles, uh, disciples of Jesus. They were in the inner circle of Jesus. Often Jesus took Peter, James, and John. You remember those stories? Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. So it's one of those James. And they, they would go hang out with Jesus. And so Peter, James, and John. James had a brother, John, both sons of Zebedee. Uh, John lived an old age. Uh, if you know the, the John, he wrote five books in the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote First John. He wrote Second John. He wrote Third John. Um, he wasn't good at thinking names, titles for his book, but that's what he wrote. And then he wrote the book of Revelation. That, that's what we know uh, of John. So John has been writing good books and about Jesus. So people have thought, well, it's John's brother, James, so James might have wrote this letter. And people thought James wrote this letter, but the problem with that is James was actually executed in Acts chapter 12. And immediately when he was executed, he lost all interest in writing books. So it's probably not that, James. <laughs> but it's most likely the other James, which is James, the brother of Jesus, or half-brother of Jesus, Mary, his mother, and probably Joseph, his biological parents. And that James we have been introduced throughout the Scripture in the New Testament, and it's most likely that that James wrote this letter. And it's very interesting, if James is the brother of Jesus, or half-brother of Jesus, he introduces himself in this letter as James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think if I was the brother of Jesus, I would have introduced myself uh, in a different way that carried a li little bit more authority and a little bit more weight, right? I could have said, James, the beloved brother of Jesus, our favorite brother of Jesus, <laughs> I could have introduced myself, James, um, the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Because that's one of the titles that was been given to James in Acts chapter 21. We could have said, or he could have said, James, a pillar of the church. That's another title that's given to James in Galatians chapter 2. Because if you read the, the book of Acts, you'll notice James has been half-brother of Jesus, but by the time Jesus rose again and went to heaven, James is now the leader of the Jerusalem church. He could have said pillar of the church. He could have said leader of the church. He could have said the favorite brother of the church, a uh, brother of Jesus. But here's how James introduces himself. He says, I, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word servant there is very interesting. In Greek, it's doulos. It's doulos. Literally means a slave. 
And slavery, of course, we have a negative um, picture of slavery was a common feature in the Roman Empire in the New Testament times. Slave is defined in a dictionary like this. Under the influence of the Roman law, a slave was usually considered to be a person, male or female, owned by another person without rights, and like any other form of personal property, to be used and disposed of in whatever way the owner may wish. That was a slave. And James here is introducing himself. Hey, I am James, not as the, the leader of the church, not as the favorite brother of Jesus, not as the pillar of the church, but I am a servant of God and a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, owned by God, owned by Jesus Christ, without my own rights, to be used and disposed in whatever way God desires in my life. That is the level of servanthood and true discipleship that James has entered into. And really that every disciple of Jesus should enter into. To say, I'm not my own. I belong to my master. Paul says uh, in his letters, you are not on your own. You've been bought with a price. You're owned by Jesus Christ. And so whatever, yes, please. Whatever um, picture you have of uh, slavery, James here says, I am his slave. I am his servant. I am not my own. I belong to God. See, if he was the brother of Jesus, which he is, I want to say a few things about his family here to get a little bit more understanding of the context of James here. If you remember, after the birth of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, Scripture says, went on to have other kids. In fact, they had five sons together, and they were named in the Scripture. Uh, they're called Jesus, the older one, uh, Joseph, and then after Joseph is James, and then Jude, and then they ran out of J names. So then Simon um, is what they named. But they also had few daughters, and the daughters are unnamed in the New Testament, and they're also unnumbered, so we don't really know how many, but uh, they're mentioned in the Scripture. But if you read carefully this, the New Testament stories, you'll notice Jesus had an interesting relationship with his family, especially his siblings and his mother. You'll find them in the Gospels. He had a, he had a strained relationship. Every time his brothers and sisters come on, on the scene, there's some sort of tension. And the tension, I think, is simply for none other reason than this, that none of them believed in Jesus. None of them thought Jesus is God. This is what it says in John chapter 7, verse 5. Uh, at least a year into his public ministries, Jesus, it, says, it says, his own brothers did not believe in him. They didn't believe in him. They've grown up with him, but they didn't believe in him. They thought, in fact, this Jesus, their, their sibling, is crazy. He's out of his mind. It says in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, when the family heard about how Jesus appointed 12 disciples and, uh, and, and have an inner circle, it says when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he's out of his mind. <laughs> he's cuckoo. <laughs> his brothers maybe embarrassed with what Jesus has been doing, trying to drag him home and says, Jesus, stop this. This is nonsense. This boy is out of his mind. And in turn, we also see Jesus, as we read the scripture, as we interpret it, we see it, he seems to be a little bit cold towards his brother as well, brothers as well. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 47, it says that when he was busy, somebody came and told Jesus, hey, your mother and your brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And you know what Jesus replied? He said, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? And then he points to his disciples, his 12 inner circle friends, and says, here is my mother and here are my brothers. I can't help but think how hurtful that was for Mary. <laughs> that he disassociated himself from claiming to be part of the same family or calling him to brothers and mother. Do you remember on the cross? His brothers and sisters were nowhere to see. In fact, do you remember that Jesus, when he was on the cross, he entrusted his mother Mary to whom? 
to John, his disciple. If you think logically and traditionally, he should have entrusted the mother to the next son. That would be Joseph. Or the next son after that would be James. Or the next son after that would be Jude. Or then Simon. But he entrusts her to John. And he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to John he said, Here is your mother. And from that time on, his, the disciple John took Mary into his own home. See, that begs the question, where are the real sons of Mary and Joseph? What happened to the brothers? Well, we don't know. <laughs> what we know is they weren't around. And in spite of all this strained relationship between Jesus and his brothers, two of his brothers, two of the five, two of his brothers were actually converted to become followers of Jesus. And one, one, of, one of them was James. And the other one was Jude. Jude also wrote a letter later in the New Testament, a short book. But James, who thought, who grew up with Jesus, didn't believe in Jesus, thought Jesus was crazy, was embarrassed by Jesus. Once Jesus died and rose again, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to James and to then to all the other apostles. After his resurrection, James goes, uh-oh, wait a second. My brother, whom I thought was crazy, who I was embarrassed about him, who had been claiming that he is God, is actually God himself. And that James says, you know what? I am a slave of God. I am a servant of Jesus Christ. I am fully engaged in now what God wants to do in my life. Now, it takes a lot for a brother to say that my brother is my Lord. That's the writer, James. Not just random James, but the brother of Jesus, who thought Jesus was crazy, now a servant, a doulos, a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing. The writer is James. And by the way, if, you, if, you're, if you're in your family, you, you are like, hey, I'm living a godly life. I, I, I'm portraying Christ. I brought Christ into all my areas of my life. And maybe my spouse or my children or my parents, they don't seem to get it. And they seem to be wandering away. And they don't seem to believe in Jesus. Listen, don't give up. If you worry, if you have been like Christ-like enough for your children. Listen, Jesus was... The Christ, and guess what? His own brothers did not believe in him. Give it time for God to do his work. And God will bring, only God can save, and God will bring his people into a relationship with him at the right time. Your job is to keep proclaiming Christ, abiding in that relationship. So, again, that's the first one. Uh, the writer, the, the author is James. Second thing, uh, who is he writing to? Who is the audience? Here it says in verse 1 of chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Right? 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Now, this is specifically talking about the nation of Israel, the Jews. Right? Jews has been scattered quite a bit already because of the, the, the Greek language and the Gentile uh, interference there. They've been already been scattered a little bit. There's been a general Jewish scattering, but that's not what he's talking about here. These are believers in Jesus who have been scattered after the first wave of persecution that came to the church in Jerusalem. You remember, everything started in Jerusalem. And in the early days of the church, you remember, there was a strong persecution that led to the stoning of Stephen. You can read that in Acts chapter 8. Right? And from that persecution, when that persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, people just ran. They got scattered. It says in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church of Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. If you read the book of Acts, in, in Acts chapter 2, uh, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon people. Guess where they were? 
They were in the upper room in Jerusalem. That was good. Acts chapter 3, guess they were the, where they were? They were in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 4, guess they were, they were? In Jerusalem. Acts chapter 5, in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 6, in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 7, in Jerusalem. They're having a blast in Jerusalem. Church is growing. Amazing worship team on in, in this church. Youth group is flourishing. Amazing stuff happening in Jerusalem. Why would I leave? Well, Acts chapter 8, <laughs> persecution comes, and guess what? People scatter. And the Jews, the people who believe in Jesus, scattered. And it says, if you read Acts chapter 9, 10, 11, and 12, you'll notice they have been driven out, not just out to Judea and Samaria, but even beyond. To Lebanon, to Cyprus, to Antioch, Cyrene, which is in North Africa. So these people have been scattered, north, east, west, South, everywhere. <laughs> and it's most likely that James, as the leader of the church in Jerusalem, is writing a pastoral letter to these Christians who've been persecuted and scattered, who has originally been, been part of the congregation in Jerusalem. If you remember, there was a lot of people in the church in Jerusalem. On the first day, do you know how many people got saved? 3,000. <laughs> 3,000 got saved on the day of Pentecost. Well, two chapters later, it says there was 5,000 disciples. So this is a fast-growing church and a lot of people. And when persecution hit, most of them went away. So that's the audience that James is writing to. Now, what is he writing about? That's the third thing, the issues. We got James as the author. We got the Jews who've been scattered uh, as the recipients. And the third thing is the issues. Now, what is James writing about. And you'll notice in the first couple verses, this is a subject line. You'll notice the, the context of the people is that they just ran from persecution. They just left trouble and they're going to these new places and in these new places, guess what? They're finding more trouble. They just keep finding themselves going from trouble into trouble and they don't seem to be handling it well. They are in it, they're having difficulties, and they seem to be running away from difficulties, finding themselves in more difficulties. And so James says in verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. See, that's his subject line. He says, if you're like trials and troubles, that's be, these people have found themselves, they've been running away from trials and troubles. They thought that if they left Jerusalem, they'll be safe. And they go to these new places and they find themselves in trials and troubles again. And, and, and James is saying, hold on a second. <laughs> Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials. I want to give you five observations about these verses here. Five observations. First one. About trials. First one, trials are continuous. <laughs> trials are continuous. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials, whenever you face them, you're going to face them. That seems like a pessimistic view of life. <laughs> if you're not in trial today, just wait. <laughs> Tomorrow you'll be in trial. If you're not in one today, you just said, maybe you came out of one. You're like, wow, that was a difficult situation. I just got out of it. Well, guess what? There's going to be one tomorrow. <laughs> they seem to be continuous. Whenever you face trials. Second observation about trials here is they are numerous. This is what it says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Whenever you face, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. <laughs> they're numerous. <laughs> Continuous and of many kinds. That's also a bit pessimistic. <laughs> they come from every angle. They come from every kind. You might have a physical trial or an emotional trial or a mental trial or, or a spiritual trial. And when you think you got one figured out, guess what? The next one comes. Numerous and continuous. But then in verse 3, he says, Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. That's very interesting. So trials are um, 
continuous, trials are numerous, but trials are producing something. That's the third one. It produces something. Now he's starting to get a, a little bit more optimistic. He's like, okay, there's some good part to this. He begins with a pessimistic view of saying, oh, it's numerous, it's continuous, but listen, it's going to develop something in you. And that's perseverance. See, if you fear that if I go through trials, if I go through difficulties, that that's going to destroy my trust in God, listen, you might discover the opposite to be true. Because when you go in your trial, when you go in your difficulties, it's an opportunity for you to trust and experience God in a way that you don't do outside of trials. That's why trials are, I think, good for us to go through. We don't know if we can cope with it. We don't know we can go through it until we are in it. So they produce something in us. Fourth observation It says in verse 4, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Trial makes you grow. Trials makes you mature. And I think that's an optimistic view as well. That if you go through trial, that you're going to grow. If you want to mature in Christian life, and you want to ask the question, how do I grow in my Christian life? Here's James's James's answer get into trouble. <laughs> you know, again and again in history, and we see this in personal testimonies and personal experience, that trials produces maturity and a growth that nothing else does. If you look at the fastest growing churches in the world, it's, do you know where it is? Yeah, in Iran, Iraq, and areas where persecution is the, at, the, at the peak. Why? Because they're going through trials and they trust God and experience God in ways that they wouldn't have done beyond it. <laughs> Look at North America. <laughs> How are we growing? <laughs> Very slow. <laughs> trials are con- uh, continuous. Trials are numerous. Trials are, makes us, uh, produces something in us. Trials makes us grow. And the fourth one here, Uh, Sorry, fifth one here, it says, trials are also joyous. This is what it says, consider it pure joy when you go through trials. Now that sounds crazy. (laughs) See, most of us are not looking for more trials. Neither did the 12 tribes of Israel. They didn't go out looking for trials. And James' message here is that when you face trials, don't go looking for them. Don't create them out of foolish actions. But when you go through trials, understand that they are going to be continuous. They are going to be numerous. They are going to develop something in you. They are going to make you grow. But they are also going to be joyous because you are going to be complete and mature, lacking in nothing. So James' message is, don't run away from your trials. You've already done that in Jerusalem. You left Jerusalem. You were scattered. But don't run away when you face trials. Face them. Embrace them. Consider them even as your friends. Be positive about them. So here's the question. How do you embrace trials in your life? How do you embrace your trials and your difficulties and your troubles... Are you always fighting them and praying God will remove them? Here's again, verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Notice that? Not lacking anything. If you let it have its course... You will be not lacking in anything. That's in verse 4. But then he says in verse 5, if you lack something, (laughs) oh, I thought we were supposed to not lack anything. But if you lack something, well, what do you lack? This is what it says in verse 5. If any of you lacks what? Wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all those without finding fault and will be given to him. 
This is very interesting. James is not changing the subject by saying, okay, let's talk about trials, fast. Now let's talk about wisdom, a, a new topic. No, 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 no. What James is saying, hey, these are trials. These are difficulties. And if you let the trials and difficulties have its course in you and you learn from it, you grow from it, you develop from it, there's something that you need to go through this. And that is wisdom. If you seem joyless in your trials, maybe what we need is a strong dose of wisdom. Wisdom here seems to be the, the disposition of humility before God when we face trials. James writes later on in chapter 3, verse 13, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by, the, by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. Wisdom gives humility. If you're not humble about our trials, we keep asking the question, God, why is it me? Why am I going through this? But if you seek wisdom and you ask wisdom, wisdom says, God, what am I supposed to learn from this? What are you doing in my heart? Where do I need to go? Where do I need to mature? Where do I need to be complete? I don't need to be exempt from this, but I need wisdom to know what God is doing in my life. Now, is that unrealistic? Of course it is. If you've been through a trial, if you've been through a difficulty, you know, yeah, I, it's not joyous. <laughs> I don't want to grow. I want to get rid of this. And humanly speaking, yes, it is unrealistic. And that's why James says that the wisdom that you need, it's not human wisdom. This wisdom comes from heaven. Chapter 3, verse 17. This is heavenly wisdom. Divine wisdom. And you ask for wisdom, and God says he'll give it to you generously, without finding fault. What that means is, if you are self-sufficient in any areas of your life, you're putting God out of a job. But when you come to say, God, I lack the strength to go through this. God, I don't have the ability to cope with these trials. God, I need wisdom. And God says, I will give it to you. And then with this in verse 6, it says he'll give it to you. But when you ask, you got to ask with belief and not doubt. Well, what are you doubting? Well, you shouldn't doubt that God has, will not give you what he promised. When you ask for wisdom, believe that God has promised this to you. He's not going to look at your resume and say, oh, I find fault here. You didn't do this, so no wisdom for you. No. God says he'll give wisdom to you without finding fault. Isn't that good news? Who here needs wisdom? <laughs> we all do. And we need to ask God for wisdom because promise of the scripture, and James says that God will give it generously. Not just a little bit here, a little bit there, but God will give it generously. And I want to end with this verse here in verse 12. He says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. James gives us a big perspective and says, yes, today you are going through trials. You are going through difficulties. They are continuous. They are numerous. They will develop something in you. They will make you grow. They will be joyous. But listen, the big perspective is one day you're going to receive the crown of life. That's the future hope. And when we have our eyes on the future hope, we can live in confidence today because of God's promises to us today. So I wonder where you are today in your trials. We all have them. They're numerous, they're constant, and the rest of it. Do you consider it with joy? Probably not when they arrive first. But have you moved on to that part to say, God, I need wisdom. And I want to be joyful even in this situation, in this circumstances, because I know you're doing a good work in and through me. 
And if you're lacking wisdom, come before him and say, God, I need it. I need wisdom. I need to surrender and ask for you to do your work in and through me. Without wavering, without doubting, I want to trust you. I want to invite the, the worship team up here and we're going to sing this final song that recognizes that we can't go through our, this life with our own strength, our own wisdom. We need to let Christ do his work in and through us. Maybe you are going through a specific trial right now. Maybe you're going through a specific difficulty, a challenging situation in your life. Maybe you need to make a decision. You don't know God. I don't know where to go. And it's causing you stress, anxiety, depression, you name it. And you might be asking, God, why me? Why is it not better? Why haven't you taken it away? And God is saying, you need wisdom. Come before me. Ask him. Ask him freely. Ask him confidently. And God will generously give it to you. As we sing this final song, uh, Yet not I, but Christ through me, is going to be a proclamation of that. For you to come to a place, not me, but Christ working in and through me. And I want to invite you, if you need prayer, somebody to pray with you as you go through these trials, I want to invite you to come to the front, sit in the front rows, and we'll have our prayer team during the song and after the song to pray with you, to point you to the source of wisdom, source of strength, that's Christ himself. Let's sing the song together.
This I hold, my hope is only in Jesus. Is that true of us? That as we go through life, as we go through trials, that we have Jesus, the source of wisdom, to walk with us, to give us everything that we need, so that we would be made complete, lacking in nothing. If you like prayer, I want to invite you to come to the front. Our prayer team will be up here, and we would love to pray with you, and to encourage you and to challenge you in your walk with Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining us this morning. Have a great rest of your Sunday and rest of your week. We'll hopefully see you next Sunday. God bless you all.